Good morning, everybody, and very warm welcome to our joint event, CR Bayouk Neon event on a consumer-centric energy transition, ensuring inclusiveness. So we're hoping to provide a very exciting and thought-provoking start to your day, kind of like a double shot of espresso, um, <laughs> but perhaps not as nerve-wracking. So today's discussion is on something that we're all very familiar with because it's on, on all the agendas and all the discussions at the moment, not just because of energy prices and what we're all going through, but because of the energy transition and the Green Deal and the major challenge that this represents uh, for society and in particular for us as citizens and as consumers of energy. So today's discussion is meant to talk a little bit about exactly what that means and how do we manage uh, in an effective way and in a just way to navigate these waters, uh, to ensure we all have energy, to ensure we contribute um, to this energy transition without anybody being left behind, which is something that we keep hearing more and more about. In fact, I was interested to see that the scientific community has come out as well this very week to say that consumers need to be put at the center of energy policy. So that's very interesting. And, and now we have you know, the full backing as well of the scientists that, that are even declaring what we all think is common sense and, and fundamental. So without any further ado, I'd like to pass the floor to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Anna Gret Grobel. She's the president of CR, the Council of European Energy Regulators. She's been our president since 2019. And uh, she has long standing experience in regulation in many sectors, in fact, in particular the telecoms and the energy sector. I think many of you will be familiar with her, so without further ado, Anna Gret. Many thanks, and a warm welcome to all of you, also from my side, and of course, also to the speakers. We will have a very distinguished uh, panel, as you can see. Adela from the European Commission, Barbara Steinbergen from the International Unit of Tenants. Claire Romay from the Energy Cities, uh, Eugene Bardin from Energy and Enercorp, sorry, and we have the two distinguished moderators, our uh, co-chairs of the Customer Retail Market Working Group, that is Natalie McCoy and uh, Jana uh, uh, Hazanova. Uh, and of course, uh, my uh, co-moderator, so to speak, uh, Monique, uh, uh, whom you also know very well uh, from uh, Zoe. Uh, with this, I would like uh, to come uh, to uh, the uh, introduction of the topic. So, on the next uh, slide, um, and uh, one more, and one more uh, about uh, the uh, CR Boy 2030 Vision for Energy con uh, Consumers uh, with the principles that we call Let's Aspire. And uh, we as uh, CR have also uh, included this in our uh, new strategy, uh, calling for a consumer-centric energy transition. So putting, uh, placing the consumer uh, in the center of the energy transition, having an energy transition that works for and with the consumers uh, and leaves no one uh, behind so that uh, all consumers' rights are uh, promoted uh, and uh, protected, uh, but at the same time uh, making the consumer uh, um, uh, part of the energy uh, system in a more uh, active way, uh, as I said, without leaving anyone uh, behind. Uh, let me on the next slides briefly introduce the uh, principles. So what does ASPIRE mean? This is the uh, for the ability, the protection, reliability. Uh, on the affordability, I think this is very obvious. And part, uh, which is often underestimated, uh, but very important with regard to affordability, is the energy efficiency first uh, principle, which was also recently, uh, let's say, uh, promoted uh, particularly by the Commission's publication of the energy F efficiency first principle uh, and the relevant uh, document. Another very important part relating to affordability is of course that there is uh, that uh, the energy transition is done in a cost effective way and part, part of this is an allocation of energy system costs in, a, uh, in an uh, effective way. Uh, finally, not to forget, all this relates has a distributional impact, uh, and therefore we need a distributional impact assessment. 
uh, and that is in particular important right now where Natalie mentioned it already regarding uh, the energy price increase so uh, what are the distributional uh, effects and what can we do uh, here or the governments in fact uh, do uh, to, um, to protect uh, in particular vulnerable consumers uh, without however uh, on the other side uh, distorting uh, the uh, competition and the market uh, to provide efficient, efficient signals, which also is an important mechanism uh, to uh, convey uh, the cost effectiveness through to the consumers. That is important. Uh, as was mentioned already, protection, of course, consumer protection stays on and uh, there are new elements which we look, look at uh, the redress, the data protection. So we enlarge a little bit uh, the consumer protection from the energy point towards data protection, including also, of course, cyber security, because as we say, as we as we know, all know, the um, the, the energy consumer is more digitalized, uh, everything gets more digitalized and so there is of course then also always the, the um, principle to ensure that everything is uh, cyber secure and the data is protected uh, and privacy guaranteed. Uh, and uh, of course there's also the important aspect uh, of uh, remit that is the protection against price manipulation the supervision uh, of energy regulators of the wholesale energy markets an important uh, element in particular also right now uh, but uh, that's uh, important and uh, consumer crisis management as a let's say global term here uh, on the other side, of course, the reliability plays uh, the the central stays on as a central element. The energy supply is an essential service uh, of general economic interest, and reliable energy supply uh, important. And an element here that needs to be um, recalled is the trust uh, that all this uh, continues to work. And I think there. We have to, as regulators, an important ro role to play uh, to ensure uh, that this trust uh, is maintained and not undermined uh, by, by false news, etc. Uh, again, an element that is that is probably new here uh, in, 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 and has an imp comes from the effect that we all have a more digitalized uh, energy system uh, to be aware of. Uh, the uh, other three um, uh, ASPIRE principles are the simplicity, inclusiveness, uh, empowerment, and the inclusiveness is part of our session today. So simplicity uh, is, uh, translates into transparency so that uh, clarity and accuracy that of course is uh, related also to the energy bill. It is important that this is uh, as simple uh, as possible uh, while being informative uh, so that of course uh, consumers understand what they are being charged for and that they can uh, make use uh, of their rights uh, in that sense. Uh, but it is also uh, an element there is the innovative services so that it is easy uh, to use these innovative services and to make actual uh, use of this uh, in order to benefit, uh, for example, uh, from, uh, from dynamic pricing. Uh, and uh, smart metering, uh, so being also in, uh, in being enabled, uh, digitally enabled, again, we have the element here of digital uh, digitalization of the energy consumers, and we ne need to take this into account in our dynamic regulation. Uh, finally, of course, uh, and I think uh, my co-moderator will play, uh, will make uh, more points on this on the advice, and uh, as I said, uh, the overriding uh, element is also that uh, the, the inclusiveness and that uh, relates to the fact or translates uh, into saying that there should not be uh, anyone uh, left behind. So we need inclusive policies and inclusive practices and energy justice. This is a new element uh, while we see, because we see uh, vulnerable consumers and we see energy poverty uh, right now and therefore uh, we, we need to take this into account uh, when designing uh, policies uh, and regulation as well. Uh, and it is a comprehensive approach, a holistic approach I would like to say here. Uh, again, uh, the 
given the fact that the consumer, the energy consumer is more digital, digitalized with, with all the benefits that it has, we also have to be aware of the digital divide uh, very often uh, between uh, urban areas, rural areas, but also between those that are digitally skilled and those that are not uh, digitally skilled. This depends on the education level, etc. And here we again have to ensure that this is uh, gap, that the, the gap that exists is closed uh, so that everyone can make use of the innovative services uh, and not uh, increased uh, by uh, different chances at the starting point. Uh, overall, we can summarize this with an integrative uh, approach, uh, which is again a, a more comprehensive understanding of the role of consumers. Finally, uh, and that is not to be forgotten, on the other side, we want the consumer to be active and therefore we have to make sure that the consumers are empowered and that there is a level playing field when they enter as a new market participant uh, and are uh, active uh, in, in, in that new role so that we see the active energy uh, consumers uh, that are foreseen in the uh, clean energy pack, uh, package and that we now have to implement uh, in that sense. Uh, these are the, the main uh, principles of the 2030 uh, vision from CR and BOIC. And now I would like uh, to hand over to Monique uh, from BOIC uh, to, um, to complete and complement uh, what I have said on the inclusiveness. Thank you. Over to you, Monique. Thank you, Annegret. And can I say Annegret was the first cup of espresso and I'm the second one. Uh, <laughs> so I hope you will not be too nervous, uh, panelists, after my, um, after my uh, let's say, warming up session, if I can say so. Uh, can I also say, I need to say it, uh, and with all my respect to Janusz, uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, when I started uh, to speak, to work on energy, I was the only wo woman on panels. And look at here. Um, so, um, and you see the shift of uh, focus. Uh, we speak now about inclusiveness might be due to the fact that there are more women in energy anyway um let's zoom in now into uh, the uh, principle of inclusiveness which we believe as from the consumer perspective is of course key and it's quite trendy huh? we speak a lot about uh, uh, the green transition a just transition a fair transition and the concept of leaving no one behind has been already used quite some some times this morning can i say don't forget that some are already left behind so we need, uh, so this is very important. They speak, the, the, the figure that is being given is 50 million of people in Europe are in energy poverty. And this is not going to be solved with the spike in energy prices. And after the winter, there might be even more. So it's very important, uh, to uh, whatever you call it, uh, that there is uh, uh, really the concept of inclusiveness is at the, at the center of attention of policymakers because it's, it's a make or break aspect of the transition to a more sustainable and climate neutral society. And what, what is very important to, to, to keep in mind is that uh, beyond the, the, the buzzword, it is the people who are going to make it happen. Not only the energy transition, but also the food transition, the, 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 the mobility, the way we eat, the way we move, the way we travel, the way we buy or not house um, um, pr consumer products. So the change has to come from the bottom. And that means that it, everybody needs to be on board. And that's really something that is very important. And the transition, and let's now focus on the energy transition, will only be inclusive if people are given the possibility to switch to more sustainable behaviors. For this, you need really the cleaner alternatives to be, first of all, to be available, to be affordable, to be convenient, and to be attractive. And so when, when you, those four concepts, how do you roll them out uh, in, in, in terms of inclusiveness? First of all, you have to design inclusive policies. And uh, you, you see currently in the energy crisis, you need to combine energy policy with social policies, meaning that you really need to, in the short term, protect the less affluent consumers with social tariffs, with direct income support. And I heard yesterday in the news that the French government is going to pay out 100 euros per household that has a net income of monthly income of less than 2000 euro. And this is going to be repeated, but this is not a sustainable solution. Uh, this, this is a short term reaction. Uh, but it's very important uh, to also design long-term inclusive policies. And can I say here, I would like to step a little bit away from we are all doomed scenario, 
because if we have an energy policy, a transition policy that is well designed, it can also be an opportunity for all consumers and especially for the low income consumers to be better off. Because if you invest into a smart policy of energy efficiency of buildings, of heating solutions that are more sustainable, uh, it, it will have the most positive impact on the less affluent ones because you will dramatically reduce the energy bill and it's the energy bill that keeps people in poverty. So if you address the energy bill via inclusive policies, you get people out of poverty. This is a really, I mean, it's a positive message, it's opportunity, uh, and it needs to be really um, rolled out uh, much more pro pro assertively. Second, you need to have inclusive practices and energy justice, as our, uh, Anna Gret already mentioned also. Uh, of course, vulnerable consumers need a, a special protection framework because they are more at risk of, of being left behind and some are already left behind. But we also need to empower them by specifically addressing them to get out of, of their, uh, let's say, uh, situation of vulnerability. Uh, and that means that you need to reach out to them. Uh, not, the average mainstream messaging is not enough. And we at the moment together with, um, so as a consumer network, but also together with uh, social workers, we are rolling out a project that is being funded by the European Union, which is called STEP, Solutions to Tackle Energy Poverty, where we really go and, and indicate to people that there are sometimes very low cost solutions that can help reducing their energy bill. So it's really, that's an empowerment part. You just tell the people or support the people in taking some small steps that are still have a big impact, positive impact on their lives. We already mentioned and Anna Grit mentioned, and that's on the next slide, um, digital divide. Uh, and that's of course, um, very important and um, while of course digital tools are useful and are needed to roll out a smart energy transition it is not only about uh, using websites for comparison tools it's also demand response i mean demand response is one of the tools that you can give to to consumers uh, to uh, to shave the peak uh, energy peaks and also uh, to, of course, reduce their, their own individual bills. But you have to take account of the fact, and that's uh, official statistics, that four out of 10 Europeans lack basic digital skills. That's quite a critical mass. And of course, digital, digital education is needed, but I would like to say, we are here at the beginning of a systemic change that is needed in energy systems. You cannot put the responsibility of this systemic change on the shoulders of educated people individually. So if you have a systemic challenge, you need to change the offer, not the people. So that means that it must be the, the digital tools need to be designed in such a way that they are just so user friendly, not over complex. We don't need over sophisticated. We need a straightforward uh, tools. And what I would like to say there is that the digital divide it's not only about the people who, who you know who are not digital natives it's also about age because uh, when you're getting older even if you have been a digital native your fine motricity you know to use keyboards on smartphones and your cognitive cognitive skills to understand software updates are much more reduced it's also about broadband you need a broadband uh, connection and you know uh, i mean this is a question of price of course of course but also there are quite some regions in europe and i'm speaking about germany i'm speaking about france where broadband is not really rolled out as it should be so if it's not reliable you cannot really uh, build your system on an unreliable uh, connectivity Cybersecurity, uh, Anna Great already mentioned it, very important, and privacy. And there are people who just don't want to go for the digital solution, which means that with all those, um, how would I say, uh, restrictions um, on the digital tool, you also need to keep in place a non, an offline solution or a traditional offer that prevents um, discrimination. And the last point I would like to make is the integrated approach. So think not only out of the boxes, but also out of the silos. And there uh, you need really to have an energy policy that is also um, um, combined with, for example, financial policies, uh, capital markets unions. So how can consumers who need to make huge investments if they, need, if they are part of the energy transition, retrofitting their buildings? You know, this is the 
the most important potential of reduction of CO2 emissions, uh, installing heat pumps, uh, you know, uh, have, uh, buying more energy efficient uh, products. But you need access to green loans to do that. Uh, you need also fiscal policies uh, uh, because you need to accompany the, this transition. You need, to, of course, uh, rental policies. Uh, and maybe there, there uh, Barbara is going to, to, to react to that. But you need uh, tenants are really very much uh, in difficulty if they want to be participating in the, into the transition if the landowner, the landlord, does not really want that. And overall, you need to really support the people with different policies. And can I say, I consider myself to be an affluent consumer. I consider myself to be an educated consumer, but it's a headache to know what heat pump goes into my house. Uh, you know, uh, not only the finances, because I, at my age, I won't have a return on investment in my lifetime, but never mind. I'm a, I'm a, I want to be sustainable, but then, do I, am I talking to the right person? Uh, the, um, the administrative hassle is quite something if you want to get a premium or, uh, from, the, from the state or from the region. And uh, well, is the advisor, is that really the right one? So you need an uh, inclusiveness. It's also about like providing consumers with one-stop shops so that they can have somebody trustworthy that supports them in going into uh, the, the, in participating in the, in, in, in this transition. So those were a few reflections I wanted to share. Uh, I hope some food for thought or some coffee for, uh, for getting your brains running if where needed. And I look very much forward to the panel discussion. And I hand over back to Natalie. Many thanks. Thanks, Anna Grant. Thanks, Monique. I, I promised you guys a, a punchy start to the morning, and I, I think uh, we're, we're well on our way. And indeed, there's a lot to think about uh, and a, a lot of issues that come up when you start talking about these buzzwords and, and, and these terms, which are much more than just concepts. They are really day-to-day uh, -day practical issues that we need to think about. And so in a moment, we'll have a few extra special guests uh, to join our panelists, and I'll tell you about them in a minute. But before we do, we have a poll we'd like to turn over to you uh, to see what, what is your, your interaction uh, with the energy sector and, and how much, <laughs> talking about headaches, maybe we should have made the question, does, does analyzing your bill give you a headache? So we can uh, just see what the, the audience and everybody in the room with us this morning has to say about looking at our, my, in my case, five-page energy bill uh, and how much can one analyze and understand with all the numbers and information provided. Okay, hope everybody's had a chance to give their answer. Let's see. Very good. Okay, so we're uh, the majority of us occasionally check it. Probably most of us check our bank account to see if the if the bill was paid. Um, we'd probably have a higher degree of answers here, but actually analyzing closely, that's still a good a good group, 33%. Although I, I'm guessing that most of us here are actually involved in the energy sector and and the kind of affluent and and educated um, energy consumer that Monique was mentioning. So even so, we either have a lot of trust in in what's on the bill or we find it a little bit overwhelming uh, in some cases. I still persevere, even though I find it overwhelming, I have to say, <laughs> it's not easy. Okay, well, we have a few more polls as we go, but uh, perhaps we'll kick off with um, our panel discussion this morning. And we have with us today a very distinguished group of ladies, in fact, uh, from various walks of life uh, who know the energy world, who know the social consumer, um, civil society environment and hopefully will give, give us some insights from their different perspectives on this question of inclusiveness and what do we actually mean by it and and who needs to be included 
what are we actually talking about and and how do we actually do it and i think that's what we like to discuss with you today and um, get some some different perspectives on that on those questions so uh, in no particular order we have with us this morning adele tisharova she's the head of unit for the consumers local initiatives and just transition unit in the European Commission in DG Enner. Um, it's DG Enner, but as we've just been discussing, it becomes much more holistic and complex than just energy. And I think recalling Monique's, there is a, a marriage here between, uh, I can't say menage à trois, but it's uh, inclusiveness, energy, and social policy. All these things need to come together. And so we'll be discussing that with, with Adela. We also have with us Barbara Stienbergen from the International Union of Tenants. And she's the head of the liaison office to the EU. So very interesting. Many of us live in rented apartments and how do we engage with energy and, and the various self-consumption and different options that are out there when we're not the owners of the property that, that we live in. Uh, Claire Roumet, director of Energy Cities, uh, who are spearheading this discussion. Many of us live in urban environments and there's a big responsibility of the entire uh, society, in, in, especially in urban sectors, how do we uh, make this transition and, and different pockets and different types of consumers who make up our cities. So I think that will be very important. And uh, last but not least, Eugenie Bardin. She is from um, a cooperative in France. Uh, they provide only renewable energy. So it's a, a new kind of business model that's starting to emerge. And it'll be interesting as well to hear what kinds of things they're doing uh, in terms of the offers and the support they give to their consumers uh, locally. So without further ado, we'll kick off, but I did promise you some special guests and um, we have a few extra characters, if you will, with us this morning, because we wanted to do more than just talk about concepts. We wanted to talk about real people. We've changed their names because you might actually know some of them, but we have with us here, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, and they are um, an older family. They have an older heating system, low digital literacy, they're on a limited pension, so they have to manage their pennies every month. Um, they prefer contact via telephone and, and letters because they have limited internet. Then the Williams family, they're middle-class family, they're environmentally conscious, they have three children, they're in a rental house, but they want to switch supplier because prices are going up and they're struggling a little bit to keep up. Then we have a whole town, the town of Down. This is what you call one of those post-industrial places. They have had better times, and, and there's not that much investment in, in the town at the moment. They have old buildings, old heating systems, a lot of coal-based uh, energy, and no electrical vehicles. So they're going through, or they haven't yet started to go through the energy transition. And these, these families and these towns, they, they are the real people we're talking about, and the ones that we need to find solutions for, practical things that we can do for them. And, and how do we interpret or put into effect inclusiveness for for these families and for these people so we'd like to turn it over then to the panelists to give us their thoughts you know what will they say to mr and mrs jones and how can they help the Williams family and especially what kind of measures can the town of down take to start slowly on this path uh, towards uh, sustainability in the energy transition okay so if i can uh, perhaps just hand over um we can start with adela if you'd like to share a few thoughts. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I guess we, we take it one by one. So shall I look at the number one first? Good, good. Um, so yeah, I think this is a very, very nice way of, uh, of discussing this topic. Um, and indeed, um, yeah, uh, very good to not to be theoretical. Um, I think the first case fits very much with what Monique has been talking about. Um, you know, as she spoke about uh, people who are not, not necessarily digitally uh, literate um, and uh, yeah, who might, yeah. Okay, so let's start with this case. Um, yeah, I mean, it's true that one can have the impression that our policies, it's all about digital, digital. And you know we have the online comparison tools and a lot of online information and so on. But I think uh, uh, in the real life, it's not necessarily the case. Um, and uh, I can imagine uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones probably live somewhere in the countryside. 
I, I would think because of also because of the coal uh, boiler. So maybe in cities we have more, you know, it, it, they will have probably gas already. Um, but I think the other case, which is very much targeted um, uh, currently, because uh, to um, to get to our 2030 target, uh, we really need to phase out coal from the system very quickly. And uh, there are incentives for for changing boilers uh, from from coal to gas. Question is whether it's not going to be too more expensive for um, Mr. and Mrs. Jones if they switch from coal to gas, and I suspect it will be. So I'm not sure they will be able to run the the gas. Uh, they will be able to pay the gas bill if they switch from coal. So I think that's a bit of a question mark here for me, whether what is obvious solution for them. And I'm sure they would be able to get the boiler uh, paid by the government. And I'm sure through their local community, uh, they can learn about these opportunities. I'm sure that, I mean, you know, it's not everything online. We have uh, consumer associations that are on the ground. Uh, we have a community um, uh, I mean, if they live in a village, uh, I can imagine that there might be, um, uh, you know, if if these grants are now available and they are financed from the recovery plan in many member states, I can imagine that the village is um, informing people because, of course, it's in the interest of village that people change their boilers, you know. So there can be a letter that they receive from the from the mayor, from from the local council, telling them this opportunity is there. Uh, in my parents' village, there is a loudspeaker where a, you know, people are informed that there is this opportunity. Come, please, next week to the to the council, and please subscribe on the list. Uh, we know very well who are the people who still have coal boilers because we smell them uh, in the streets. So we know who these people are. You can distinguish, and so uh, these people can easily. I think they can be targeted if there is a will in the village. These people can be targeted. I am not sure um, that the bill will not get higher, and I, I suspect that it will get higher. And I think this might be the blockage uh, for Mr. and Mrs. Jones, because if their house is not as in, uh, insulated and if they just change the boiler, they will have a bigger bill. And that is a problem. And uh, that's why the commission is pushing for both, of course, insulating the house and changing the boiler. So that could be part of the same support scheme. I think I stop here and I let my other panelists continue because, of course, there are other aspects we can cover. But OK, I started with the boiler. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, no, absolutely. Thank you very much, Adele. That's a very interesting perspective and it reinforces the need. It does take a village. You know, it's this community and we we need local uh, support measures closer to the to the citizens and the consumers. I'll just jump over to Barbara, if I may. I know Barbara has um, a commitment at 10 o'clock. So, um, start with whichever town you'd like before you have to go, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to have a little bit of interaction with you, but uh, I'll maybe just hand over and give you the freedom of, of talking to one of our guests. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I'm from the International Union of Tenants. We are representing 30% of people in Europe living in rental apartments, but also those um, who are owning their apartments in Central and Eastern Europe um, after these flats have been um, privatized by the state. So I'm giving a short comment on all the three, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, the Williams and uh, the town of Down, if I may. Um, first of all, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, they are an older couple, if I might see that. So we have, have also to think um, and how far can they do this investment? Is there ever a return on investment for them? I think we have to think about that. So um, it's a question also um, of um, the age of the household. Mm -hmm. And I think it is more than fair um, that the, those people who want to change their house, uh, which is obviously owned, uh, it's an ownership um, um, status, that they get professional help from consumer organizations, um, also from tenants organizations. Um, uh, I think they need access to easy financing. Uh, it is sometimes called one-stop shop, but also for those people, it is tricky to, to deal with that because they really need in person an energy consultant in their house telling them, okay, we can check what we can do for you. I think it is not okay if we just leave it to the older households. Okay, you can uh, find the information on the internet and it is very easy to do everything. This is absolutely not the reality. So this is about uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones. The Williams family, well, they are more uh, experts uh, and they want to save energy. They want to uh, change the supplier. 
and they live in rental housing. So this is a little bit the classical case for the tenants unit. Um, well, first of all, changing supplier, that's easy. That's not the point. The point in this case of the Williams family is what if the landlord wants to renovate their house? This is the case we should talk about. Um, to say it very clearly, as a tenant, your possibilities in having a say or a loving level playing field, we had this in this wonderful Aspire model that was just presented by Anne Gret. Well, um, you don't have uh, the aces in your hand. Actually, the landlord can decide what is done and you have nearly no say. This is the reality all over Europe. Second point, in 21 states of the European Union, the costs for this renovation can be directly passed on to the tenants. So you pay for it. Well, if you would have the energy savings afterwards, then it would be a fair deal. But it is not a fair deal because the rent increases are in most of the cases, unfortunately, not balanced by energy savings. And that is a real problem which is preventing us making big steps towards the change in energy, towards a carbon neutral um, sector of housing. And this is something we have to address. How to address that? Two points, I think, very important. From the technical point of view, we need to implement the concept of housing cost neutrality into all energy legislation to come. Which means, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, that those rent increases are fully balanced by energy savings. This means that the people can stay in the house and are not evicted by renovation. There is a technical term for that, which is called renoviction. So we have to prevent the renoviction of those people. And if I may say so, in many, many um, cities with attractive housing markets where there is a high housing shortage the energy renovation is used to get rid of the tenants so this is um, not only a problem with energy policy this is a problem for the whole society this phenomenon is called gentrification and um, so we have to do something uh, about that the second point we have to do definitely um, is to reach a kind of level playing field. So those people rent the house, they pay a monthly rent. They should have a say. They should be able to deal on level playing field with the tenants. And there are a few countries who made already a big progress in this question. This is about co-design, co-management. I give you one example. Um, in the Netherlands, 70% of the inhabitants of the buildings have to say yes to the energy renovation proposed by the landlord, 70%. So the landlord needs to have a majority, which means he has to present a business model to the tenants where they are able to stay in the house, have a good energy balance, and are also able to pay this. I think this is a very good um, thing to do, and it is also uh, applicable to other countries. Another system, also very interesting, is in Denmark. Denmark is already very far when it comes um, to cleaner and greener energy, as we all know. We are always a little bit uh, jealous because uh, they are so strong in this. Well, why is that um, so in the rental market? Because the tenants are the board of the housing associations. So the tenants say, okay, housing association, you renovate it, but it has to be good for everybody and our people need to stay. So this is about co-design, co-determination, co-management. And last but not least, this is something to think about in a different way. I want to say something about Sweden. In Sweden, we have the system in rental housing that the landlord is responsible for the heating. So he rents out a warm house, not a cold house. And when you turn around the responsibility, it is, of course, of primary interest of the landlord to make this a business case for him. So I think these are three interesting models uh, in the rental sector.
very, very shortly to Town of Down. I think Claire Romé, my dear colleague, will say a lot about that because this is really her case. But um, to say it very shortly, um, this is also about integrative urban planning. This is about taking the people of the quarter that you just renovate with you. So I think this is also something about where we have to talk about mandatory institutionalized participants, uh, tenants participation and residents participation when it comes to the energy renovation of entire quarters. So far from here. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, fast uh, overview and, and but really concrete things for, for the different types of, of consumers and, and citizens we have here today. Um, I, I hope we have a chance to discuss further some some scary words, but also some encouraging words that you shared with us. The renoviction is certainly on the terror side, the co-determination, co-management, that's on the hopeful side. So there are things that can be done uh, and that we can all engage with. So very, very interesting to, to hear as well of those practical examples that across Europe are, are being rolled out. But um, just to keep the flow going, Claire, any any thoughts here for our, for our consumers? Well, I think it's first of all, it's a it's a great pleasure to be here. Not only well accompanied, but also because in terms of content, I think it's it's kind of a, it, there is a new conversation going on, and I'm very I'm very happy to see that there is some moves. And uh, we had a, a workshop at the beginning of the this week to prepare actually uh, with different actors. Uh, what can be done uh, under the Citizen Energy Forum that uh, Adela is uh, organizing in, in December, what can be done on the Just Transition agenda and to indeed make sure that uh, we include all vulnerable consumers into the um, into the energy market and many of the discussions that we had uh, have, have some echoes in the, this morning's session. Uh, one, for example, of the last uh, recommendation that we have identified as potential way to go was to really get more inspired by the tenants democracy model and see how, in, if there is any kind of principle that can be uh, imp implemented in to making sure that we have a, an energy democracy so system. So a system, an energy system that is more democratic, looking at how the tenants democracy is part of the very uh, core, uh, uh, it, it's one of the features that uh, allow Denmark to have a stable housing market in comparison to other and, and also in Netherlands. So it's something that we want to actually discuss with you to see whether we can get inspired by the housing uh, market to see what can be uh, then done also on the energy market. But not only about the fact that they are both linked um, in terms of supply, but more mostly uh, also about the way they are governed. What are the governance models that we can use uh, from a housing market uh, approach that could be uh, helpful in the energy market? So this is a conversation to start, and I'm very happy to, to, to see that indeed we, 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 can, we can do that. The second thing before just to go into your uh, case studies, which are very interesting, is that um, each time I'm, I'm listening to Monique, I'm, I'm always so happy and so um, uh, confident that by the fact that indeed the consumers are represented by her in general, because as a consumer, I just feel protected. And I want to say it because really, I think it, she's always um, managing to put the, the the real challenge in the core of her speech, and and I'm I'm really I'm just so so happy as a consumer <laughs> that we are so well represented in Europe in general, and um, and then to go to come back onto the the, the different um, um, families, the first family, and indeed Adela, when you spoke about the fact that indeed uh, in the village, so in many of, of the villages, the the way to inform are the loudspeaker uh, in the going going by uh, and trying to just get get an information. And I'm I really wondering why we did stop that because actually maybe this is really a much more low tech best way 
to do inform everybody. And uh, we have seen that, for example, with the COVID the sanitary crisis, that uh, we, a lot of information are currently now to, to make people vaccinated. But there is really, um, we have a miss, I think we have a misrepresentation on how to communicate to consumers in general. And uh, we need to learn from the COVID crisis and uh, what kind of population we couldn't manage to reach. And uh, and indeed to to maybe come back I mean to to much more smarter solution to com to communicate and frankly speaking I think the loud speaking in the in the street of the village I think this is a very uh, it it's a good way to to inform and I don't see why it, it could not be uh, replicated and uh, and and investigated forward surely I also when i listening to monique before i felt quite old because i'm not sure i can understand my my bills and uh, frankly speaking they are becoming so complicated and then i always lose my passwords and so on and so on I mean, like everybody but i mean let's be honest this is really a nightmare this is always has been a nightmare and it's becoming a nightmare of a nightmare so now i, I don't think i have done any kind of improvement more concretely in terms of solutions for those three case studies and i really like also the approach that you have proposed in this workshop to have three case studies because that's the best way to have a, a, a real grounded debate for the first family i only see one option it has to be 100 uh, 100 financed a retrofit of the house it will be good for everybody it will be good for the the, the air quality in the, in in this uh, area because it's not a, when you are in a rural area that the air quality is good necessarily it will be good for the uh, attracting people to come and live in that uh, uh, rural area at some point we have um to have schemes for the 100%. Like in in uh, this week, I think it's uh, Can Europe who, dis who displayed uh, a map of where what is the payback for heat pump uh, in Europe. And in Belgium, for example, the payback is never, never. So it's like, <laughs> it's never. And in Italy, at the contrary, it's always because in Italy they have put a scheme that is actually paying 110% of the refurbishment. So now they are currently going through a, a shortage of workforce to do refurbishment because the, 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 the help and the system that is put in place have created such a, a demand that they just cannot have, uh, uh, manage to put the workforce in front of the, of the demand. But so this is, a, this is about schemes. And in, in the case of Mr. and Mrs. Jones, I don't see any other option than investing 100% public money into the refurbishment of the house and the replacement of the coal facility. It will be good at the at the very end because if it's also in a rural area anyway anyway is this this is a, this is not worth connecting it them to a district eating it's not worth to invest into the network so all the investment that we do and where that we are forced to do for example in nuclear power plant these are billions of billions of billions of billions if you put that in paying for 100 percent refurbishment um, schemes for the for, for these specific cases uh, then you, you don't need that investment in those uh, power plants. So this is really about where do we want, we want to put the, the, the public money. And public money in power plants is not uh, the best way to be smart for the future. The best way is to pay even if it is for a private home. The second family, it's in that case, and I, I'm already too long, but the second family uh, there, what I would put is because they are in a rental home, I would uh, propose to them a schemes to invest in solar panels on their school roof and that they could become part of the, of the energy system. They could start uh, having a, a share. Of, of, uh, of the production, but they could they have in they have capacity of, inv of investing into um, the energy production. They only cannot do because they don't have land access. So this and then of course it will all be so, also be something that is good for the education. Uh, so that's the way I would I would go for the town of Down. <laughs> I love it actually. It's really I mean it's very very useful to have this kind of a 
of driver to, to, to of our own thinking, so not to be lost into a word, empty words. Um, in, in that case, I would really go for uh, looking at uh, the heat mapping. And this is a cursory um, proposition that uh, it's, it's a proposition by the DG, uh, by DG Energy to put it as a compulsory um, requirement for local authorities to do heat planning, heat mapping and heat planning. And here I'm quite I mean, I'm quite sure that there is heat resources somewhere that can replace the coal, and that's the and it can be geothermal. Um, the best way is really to have a, a comprehensive planning uh, of the heat, and of course also of uh, of uh, how you can uh, cycle in the city and get out of the cars from the city. So it's it, the year I would go really on on looking and mapping the resources, the resources and the needs, and this is something that can become compulsory as part of the of the HED, but should also be really supported and with very specific. Um, funding streams, I would say. I think there is a big investment needed in the planning, in really in the planning at district and city level. And if we do that, then we can do smart investments. Otherwise, we will continue to just go into a piece by piece of the puzzle and never get the full picture. I, I'm stop here for oh. the moment. No, thanks very, very much, Claire. I think you've touched on some very important points and, and we'll certainly be coming back to this issue of democracy and, and the different facets, you know, what it actually means. It means self-consumption and taking control of your own energy and participating if you want, but it also means uh, taking into account those who don't participate or cannot participate and how to ensure that we can all um, well, not be left behind, but certainly engage and ensure that we have our basic energy needs and comfortable standard of living. So I think that's very important, um, understanding democracy in, in its different forms. I don't know if Adele, if you want to jump back in, uh, you only commented at the, at the start, but if you have anything you'd like to add now after hearing as well, our other panelists, you're, you're very welcome. Well, thank you very much. Um... Uh, very much support what uh, what other panelists said. Um, maybe just for uh, slide number two, case number two, I would add um, that they can also act on the appliances that they consume at home. And I think we should not forget about it because the appliances is an enormous part of our, our energy consumption. So not just the building, but also the electric appliances we have. So I think that uh, they can save money by going for the most energy efficient ones. And I fully support the idea that they invest elsewhere that they join in a citizens energy community or they invest uh, in solar panels installed somewhere else because of course they cannot install unfortunately solar panels on their building unless they have a different system tenant, tenant owners in place for the city um a very interesting case i think here we have to you know we can talk about the governance we can talk about changing the energy um supply changing the economy of this of the town changing the society of the town uh, I can kind of sense that there is both supply and demand uh, issues. So that the supply is not green and there is no demand for for green um, energy. So I think it's a good case of um, governance, engaging the consumers, engaging the citizens. So top, uh, let's say bottom up, and also top down, changing the govern, uh, you know, the, the the mayor or the the council of the town. Uh, so I think it has to come from both angles. There needs to be some vision new vision for this town, but I think it's very important. And that's what we do with the, with the coal regions. Um, and let's say with the just transition uh, project we have in the commission, uh, there needs to be the bottom up. You know, the, um, the citizens, the companies, they need to get together and all the local actors, they need to get together to have a new vision for, for the town. Uh, so I think the, the both top up and bottom up, bottom up and top down is needed. And so um, a kind of societal um, change in this town is necessary. Um, yeah, because people need to have a different vision for, for the future, because otherwise the jobs are not sustainable in this town as well. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Adela. I think it comes back to, we keep hearing it again, that alone, 
this is all overwhelming. And as Monique was saying, it's too much of a burden for any individual person to take on. And we need a structure and a community and policies and, and really our governments have to put, you know, put their money where their ambitions are, if you, you can understand the, the expression. Um, I just want to as well give the floor now to Eugenie. Um, I don't want to forget our last panel member to see if she has any insights from, from the practical experience of, of her cooperative in France as well kinds of solutions that would be available to, to our case studies, to our consumers here. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, uh, I had some connection issues, so I won't be able to turn my uh, camera on. So sorry for that. But uh, yeah, thanks a lot for this really interesting uh, webinar. Um, so I'm Jenny Bardin, working for, for Enercop, um, a cooperative supplier of renewable energy in France. Uh, and uh, it was created in 2005, so uh, more than 20 years ago, at the beginning of the op opening of the, of the market in France. Um, uh, and I will now focus on uh, the different uh, consumer cases um, and uh, to, to try to show how uh, the supplier can go beyond the, their role uh, of supplier and uh, how they can, as green cooperatives such as Enercop, uh, help different type of consumers to be involved uh, at their level in the in, in the energy transition. Um, for uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones and their little dog, <laughs> don't forget the dog. Um, uh, it's um, uh, the green electricity, the green cooperative as supplier. Uh, and actually, it's uh, it's a point for the three cases. Uh, the the supplier can provide a real green electricity offer by contracting directly with um, local producers of renewable energy sources. And this direct contracting uh, method model, it's also a way to have less interaction uh, with the market. And we all know that this month the market went really crazy. And so it's also a way for the supplier to try to protect also the consumer uh, from these um, fluctuation of the market. Uh, so first to provide this green electricity offer uh, and also with clear information about what is behind the plug. Um, uh, and it can be uh, not only electricity, actually. Um, uh, and um, I, I'm talking about a supplier, which is also a cooperative. So it's important to note, to, to, to specify that uh, uh, Miss, Mrs. and Mr. Jones and also the family Williams can, and also the city of Down uh, can uh, not only be a client, but also a member uh, of the cooperative. Um, and it's also a way to, to interact more with the, with the supplier and uh, with um, all the contracting methods, for example. And it's uh, even more important for consumers with limited knowledge of the functioning of the electricity market, which is really uh, complicated. Um, and uh, more specifically for Mr. and Mrs. Jones, it's also really important uh, that the supplier maintain a reliable and in-house customer service and a direct phone line um, available all day long um, for consumer like like yeah uh, the Jones uh, with um, uh, limited internet access and also to provide a. Uh, 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 a bill, uh, a paper bill, yeah, uh, it's really uh, important. And also this uh, customer service uh, should be available also to, to explain the bill because, yeah, I really agree, it's really uh, difficult to uh, uh, understand the bill. And even if I'm working for a supplier, I really need uh, really often to, to, to ask questions to my colleague in charge of the of the tarification, so it's 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 really complicated, and that is why it's even more important to have this um, um, this uh, customer service also available by phone um, uh, or uh, directly by uh, having an um, appointment with the uh, with the supplier. Um, and also, uh, and it's actually uh, a point for the three cases. Um, um, as a cooperative, the supplier uh, can really have a local uh, presence. Uh, in the case of Enercop, we are we are a network of uh, 11 local cooperatives, uh, and it's uh, really important to ensure this proximity I already talked about and this local presence. Um, and it's I can 
uh, it's possible to link actually this reflection with uh, the recent uh, renewable energy communities um, recently uh, introduced in the European law and now uh, the European law and now in also in the French law actually and uh, renewable energy communities uh, by their local presence uh, their um, proximity can really be a way to uh, ensure inclusiveness um, and last but not least for Mr. and Mrs. Jones, um, it's important also to, to notice that suppliers can fight against uh, energy poverty uh, by putting in place, for example, uh, there are several me methods, but for example, they can put in place a micro donation mechanism. Um, that is to say that customers uh, can decide to donate a certain amount uh, each month links to uh, their consumption of kilowatt hour to help actually uh, other cost uh, customers or uh, other clients or other members of the cooperative. Um, but the, the supplier also itself can uh, decide to donate a certain amount to a local association fighting at the local level against uh, energy poverty. And then, uh, so I will try to be a bit faster because uh, I want to have time uh, for the questions also. Uh, but for family Williams, um, um, it's um, it's really important also to to provide personalized advices uh, on how to reduce uh, the the electricity consumption uh, with online tools or uh, or. Um, or not online tools, for, for, for example, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, it's important to maintain this, um, uh, this um, uh, phone line also, but uh, so to provide these advices uh, to, to reduce the, the electric, electricity consumption, uh, to, um, to have this uh, sensibilization to uh, sobriety, uh, and also to, uh, of course, to, to have, to help uh, the, the, the clients and the member of the cooperative to have a lower bill at the end of the month. Um, and also, uh, it's important to notice that Family Williams have, uh, uh, are interested in renew renewable and green solutions. So uh, as a cooperative, um, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, an opportunity uh, as a, as a uh, cooperative supplier, it's an opportunity for the clients to be more than just an a client, but also a member of a local cooperative. And uh, cooperatives are, um, in this way, a solution to empower, also part of the solution to empower citizens. And last but not least, about the town of Down, um, the um, green cooperative as supplier can um, uh, really provide um, um, like a, a bit like I already said for Family Williams or the, the Jones, but can provide advices, uh, personalized uh, advices uh, after the um, uh, after studying actually the, um, the consumption of the, of the town, but um, personalized advices on how to reduce the, elect the electricity consumption in the public buildings. Uh, and uh, a supplier can also finance energy efficiency programs, but this point is maybe a specificity, uh, uh, um, a specificity of the French uh, legislation. It's called the um, Certificat d'Economie d'Energie, but yeah, it's, it's maybe specific in France, but still it's possible for suppliers to finance such programs for cities. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, as cooperative, um, it's, um, it's, it's a way uh, for, 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 for cities, um, it's an opportunity for cities to, to use uh, uh, the, 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 the cooperative movement to create really local solidarity to gather citizens um, around an energy transition project um, um, at the city level or at the um, uh, street level, like it's re it can really uh, go um, uh, uh, really more locally than the city level. And um, last but not least, uh, the city can also be a member of the cooperative, uh, take a share in the cooperative, for example, and contribute in this way to the development of renewable uh, energy projects. Uh, for example, uh, through the, the installation of solar panels on the roofs uh, of the public buildings, of the, um, of the schools, and so on. Um, so, 
I, I will stop now. Uh, I hope we will have enough time to answer the questions. Oh, thank you. No, absolutely. No, you did very well. Thank you, Eugenie. Don't, don't worry about the time. We, we still have a little bit ahead of us. So very good. And nice to hear the different solutions um, at both individual and community levels that you can you can envisage through a cooperative action. So very, very interesting and very encouraging. And also energy efficiency measures by suppliers. Absolutely. And um, that is something that's also foreseen in EU legislation, but it's good to hear it's happening somewhere on the ground in practice. So that's that's also very interesting. Um, we have had already some ex very interesting comments uh, from our participants on the other side that we can't see, uh, including some observations, very interesting observations about uh, the fuel switch. So for example, for the Joneses to move from coal uh, to an electrified uh, heating system um, and hopefully based on a renewable supply behind that. Uh, also, depending on where you live, um, the possibility of district heating, both for the Joneses and for the town of Down, and to tap into that potential uh, and going back to what Claire was saying about the, the mapping, the heat mapping and planning to see, you know, what kind of solutions are possible in, in different contexts. Um, certainly, certainly very useful in, in Northern Europe, less common for those of us here in Southern Europe. But without um, wanting to jump directly into the bait, uh, and we still have a few other questions already coming in from, from our participants, don't be shy, send us any question you like, uh, and we'll put, we'll put our panelists on the spot. Um, but before we do that, we wanted to ask you, uh, what kind of consumer are you? And we have one more co poll. We've heard a little bit about different solutions. We've met our three, our three families here, but we wanted to see with you, what kind of consumer do you consider yourself? An active one, so you're aware of, of the latest developments, you use comparison tools to find the best offers, uh, and you're actually ambitious in terms of wanting to, to implement energy efficiency measures in, in your home, uh, maybe solar panels or uh, joining an energy community. You're moderately active, you, you know where to get the information on switching, you read your bill carefully, uh, so you're you're fairly aware, you're less active, you you kind of know the different elements that go into energy consumption and and the, check your billing maybe monthly, maybe less frequently, um, or like many of us, rather disengage. We pay the bill, um, but maybe don't understand the details or, or look into the details and the information that is provided there. So just a quick straw poll, as they say, on the type of consumer that you you identify most with. And um, this goes back to to many of the discussions we were having just now on on how um, how we can achieve the the transition. And Monique was saying earlier, starting from the bottom, and it's not just actually our energy, but it's it's everything we do in, in modern life, uh, the way we shop, the way we the way we eat, uh, the type of entertainment and leisure we undertake. Uh, everything fits together. But in particular today, we're talking about our our energy bills, our energy consumption, and, and facing those costs and those needs. Hopefully most of you have had a chance to answer the poll now. And we shall see the results in, the, in a flash. Here, here they come. Let's see. Okay, so quite a big group of us consider ourselves like less active. Um, you know, we, we are aware when we pay our bills and we are aware of our spending and our consumption, but maybe don't dedicate ourselves to it full time. Um, and this is a function of modern life. Who has the time to dedicate to just one aspect of, of life, which is the energy bill compared to many other bills that we receive every month. Uh, so it is it is a challenge. And, and this is just one piece of, of a bigger puzzle of modern life. So I'm not surprised to see that 42 of us are consider ourselves less active. Mm -hmm. And a smaller group to be full, you know, active, very much engaged and participating in the different solutions, 15%. So I, I think this probably is fairly representative um, I would expect in some parts of, of Europe or further afield, the, the bottom group to be bigger, 
but uh, certainly this is a very interesting slice of life, as they say. Okay, so now we've done our poll. We've had uh, already an initial uh, suggestions and reflections from our panelists, and now we'd like to open the Q&A uh, to all of our participants. And we have, um, if I can start off with one question we had earlier on um, about billing. So some of us receive our bill every month, or we might even be able to check every 15 minutes on an app, but others receive it once a year. Quite a few people, actually. What 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 can we do, and how how can you really manage your energy consumption in in that situation, and how can you be aware of of choices um, and solutions and options to get out of the cycle, the yearly spending cycle? Any thoughts? Well, I think can I can... say something. <laughs> Monique, yes, thank you. Sorry, Adela, I didn't want to go. I mean, this is exactly where uh, what I said in my warming up uh, reflections, uh, where I said you have to change the offer if you want to change the, the system. So if you have a, a smoother invoicing system, which allows the consumer to react more quickly, uh, then of course you empower, empower that consumer to have a more swift uh, control over their expenses, less frustration, less can I say catastrophic situations uh, where, where possible and, and so uh, you need to change the way you invoice and that is really easy with digitalization so why don't they do it thank you thanks very much Monique. I think as regulators something we come back to as well as the need for individual meters so the first hurdle we assume everybody has a meter but the first hurdle is actually a hardware one make sure we've all got an individual meter or a heat allocator in the case of heating billing. So you know, you know, somebody's tracking exactly what's being consumed and, and you yourself can then have awareness of, of what you're using and then what you're paying for it. So they go together, of course. Um, but it's still not a given in many parts uh, of Europe to, to have your own meter and to then have accurate billing based on that measurement. So I think that's a first step um, and it starts there and we had another interesting reflection oh sorry Adela do you want did you want to comment on that no I just said I just wanted to say that indeed uh, but also smart meters you know to have um, like access to, uh, to to real time information because if you want to have more frequent bills I mean ideally you need to have a smart smart meter so that also the supplier has this uh, real time information about you um, so yeah I mean but this is important um, I do study my annual bill because what I like is the last, uh, there is a picture at the end which says how I compare with others. And that's actually what I really like. And I would like to have it for my commune. And uh, because of course not everybody has the same supplier in the same street, but at least for, for my village or my commune, I would like to know how I compare. So not just with the average, but I would like to compare with the people who live near me. And that's the most interesting bit of the bill for me. Hmm. Oh, that's that's very true. We actually, in, and uh, one of our previous customer conferences at CR, we had um, a presentation from a, a California, uh, I guess, a consultant. And, and what motivated the consumers there was competing with the neighbor. If he can do, I can do. How come I'm spending so much more than he is in that comparison at the end of the bill? How is that possible? I, I'm sure I can do just as well. Uh, he's got the same kind of house, you know, two cars, what have you. Surely I can I can match him, and so it wasn't so much how much am I spending, but if I, why am I spending more than others, and, and that seemed to be a motivator uh, in in the behavioral studies that they were doing. So it's, it is it is interesting to see that uh, dynamic uh, that we have as people. Absolutely. Okay, we have another question here. It's more of a reflection, perhaps, about uh, going back to the question of of the individual burden, and for example, retrofitting. Um, and we were hearing about the options for Mr. and Mrs. Jones. Somebody really needed to do it for them uh, because they would not be getting a return on the investment, nor could they up, put up the upfront costs for that investment. And, and how should we change the dialogue from the burden is on the individual and he needs to engage and he and she need to do this to it's uh, an entire systemic, as Monique was saying, 
change that we need to do um, per street, per neighborhood, per district, uh, to make it happen in a, in a more structured way, uh, rather than uh, one by one, we, we're all made to feel guilty if we're not doing it and to find our own way forward um, instead of putting it into a, a kind of a systemic and, and uh, supported process for, for all consumers, whether it be through through uh, the town crier or through the energy consultant coming to your home to give you advice or or just rolled out uh, in, a, in a structured way, the way, in fact, some smart meters are, are being done across many of our communities. Any reactions to those ideas? It's, it seems common sense. It's quite sensible. Claire? Yeah, maybe it's not directly on that one because indeed I think you just uh, already answered and I have uh, not so so much to say. But in general, I think uh, one aspect that is uh, not enough on the agenda still is that uh, you need to have regulators with means to regulate, not uh, and 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 to to check that indeed the market is working. The problem we have now is that we have good rules. I think those principles that you have uh, worked together between the, the, the consumer organization and the regulators is, are very good. And uh, we, but we have not yet uh, enough means to ensure the, the implementation of the, of the law, the, the enforcement sometimes, and um, the market actors uh, are just going quicker and quicker in uh, finding ways to, to do things differently, I would say, and they are not always good. So I think we would need to have a better, uh, I mean, to really, and I, I hope that the Citizen Energy Forum can also really be a place about uh, dividing the role and, and advocating together for much stronger uh, support to make sure that uh, all the, the, the rules are implied because it's not the time for a new regulation or it's not the time for it's the time for for having the means to really do it it's like when i insisted on the means to do the planning at local level if we want to have the uh, the right system we really need to to invest on those absolutely enforcement uh is is also very important and and having the means to 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 do all these different um if you will, tasks, but really to, to bring them home at, at the different levels. Uh, I think that's that's crucial, not just for regulators, but I think also for public authorities and local government. Um, and that, that you mentioned very clearly, it is it is a major challenge to to get to get the budget in, as much as anything, but also the the capacity, it, human resource, and the knowledge and the expertise on some of these questions. And that's that's also a challenge. Um, even energy efficiency people who really understand the solutions and the practical ways to do things, uh, finding those people, training those people, taking those people out into the field and, and talking to, to families and towns, that, that's also part of, I guess, if you will, the, um, the ambition and now the concrete challenge that we have to, to really try to, to tackle um, at, at various levels. So uh, thank you very much for supporting the regulators. We, we do our best <laughs> with the resources we have, but of course, uh, we are always interested to to do better and and to be able, in fact, to to respond to to all of these different elements. We have a comment now here. Um, being a consumer is a full time job. That's the trouble, isn't it? We we all have other full time jobs, and it, it's just it's difficult to keep up. Uh, While well, at the same time, uh, keeping an eye on your bill and on your consumption and, and making sure all the bits fit together. And and we're all human, and you know we all have irrational behaviors as well. This is the thing that we talk about in, in the behavioral science world of, of understanding what, what we do and, and what decisions we, we take and, and our behaviors. So we have um, maybe time for a little one more question. Um, I don't know if, if uh, thinking about the legislative package that we have on the table now, um, this Fit for 55 package, which is actually quite far ranging, from energy efficiency to, to more renewable targets to um, alternative infrastructure for new types of, of energy. Um, if from your experience and from your different perspectives, is there any one thing in this ginormous legislative package that you think will really help uh, and could really you know, 
be that potential to, to make the difference that we're trying to, to have here. It is a lot of material to go to go through. Oh, Monique. I mean, the, the package has a, a wealth of very, very promising provisions. They now need to be rolled out. I mean, first of all, they need to be adopted. <laughs> And then they need to be rolled out um, uh, on the ground. And the, what we are worried about is that you have a sense of emergency, of urgency. I mean, we have not a generation to change the way we heat uh, or the way we, um, you know, we use energy uh, against a very slow rollout with, uh, you know, counterproductive uh, lobbying from some sides. You know, there, there will be, of course, a reshuffling of. Uh, of uh, energy providers and energy income from, I mean, I speak now from the provider side. So we really hope that there will be, I mean, we are very much uh, supportive of the of the package. Of course, you can always improve, but the, it's really the, the right direction, the right impulse, but now it needs to happen on the ground. And that means, as, as, as Claire also mentioned, you need to give the means to the, pol to the policy that is be, uh, behind the regulatory framework, and it needs to happen, maybe not today, but tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. And that's really what's the, the sense of urgency that needs to be uh, going along uh, the implementation of the package. Thanks, thanks, Monique. I saw Adele also raised her hand there. Uh, any, any insights? You're biased though, of course. <laughs> I am biased, yeah. But I would say that there shouldn't be one single thing in this package which will make a difference because the package is precisely designed as a package. So it's a balancing between regulatory measures and pricing instruments within supply and demand, acting across all sectors of the economy. So there shouldn't be one solution, but each of the pieces of legislation has two, three key things which will make a major difference. But the package works as a package. I think that's important. Uh, and it's, of course, a challenge also to keep it like that. But the different instruments support each other. Yeah. Thanks. Very good. Absolutely. It was a trick question, to be fair. <laughs> and we have actually, and we have uh, the second part of it coming in December. I think we shouldn't forget we have still the buildings and the decarbonization of gas, um, which is uh, which is missing currently. Absolutely, all the pieces of the puzzle all need to fit together. Absolutely, very good. Well, we've had a chance to at least swim a little bit in the deep end following the the deep dive that Monique gave us at the beginning of the session um but there's certainly much more that we could we could discuss and we can go into we have one final poll for our participants and um, as we've been talking a lot about the transition and what we can all do and what what our families can do and so we wanted to put to you as well um what kind of things would you be considering to changing as a consumer um, considering the you know this energy transition and the and the greener economy that we're trying to build uh, through this if you will puzzle of of measures and policies that fit together we have a few options renovate my household with energy renewable energy solutions buy an electric vehicle seek advice to decrease energy consumption and bills a change energy supplier and, and move to a, a green contract or perhaps you know there are many other solutions and, and options. Uh, some other one that we we haven't put here on the on the screen. And or uh, all of the above, we probably should have said, <laughs> since uh, everything needs to be um, put in, if you will, in a holistic way. Uh, and there's no one solution to to becoming more sustainable and and to managing our our energy resources. Give everybody a second to to think which one. There's no right or wrong answer, of course, but and we all have different means. Some of us are pedestrians like myself in rental housing or already have a fairly sustainable energy mix in our community. Thanks very much for, for joining us and participating. 
Let's see where you fall here. So many of us are considering renovations. So energy efficiency renovations for the home or renewable energy solutions, combining them. But it's a good balance between, between the different options. Surprisingly, the green contracts is, is the lowest ranked. I wonder if, why that would be. Maybe there are not so many green offers where you live or um, it's not the most sustainable, you know, long lasting um, solution. All the other elements perhaps have a, a lasting effect in terms of your, reducing your consumption levels. We have a comment here, uh, indeed, why not consider sharing a car rather than owning a car? And that is certainly encouraging people uh, to give up their wheels. Public transport, shared solutions. I think part of the we have another comment here. One of the issues may also be a question of trust, going back to the, the idea of trust. Um, when you see advertising for a green offer, uh, you know what's behind it and, and the discussions around some concerns of greenwashing that uh, policymakers and even here in our European debates, we talk about a lot. Very good. And other, so there are many other things we haven't thought of today, but that are certainly part of a solution. Well, thanks again for, for joining and, and taking part in our games and our, and our polls. Um, without further ado, I'll hand over to, to Janusz Jadowski. He's the president of the National Energy Ombudsman Network, and they have a very important role in defending consumers and helping them solve uh, problems, disputes, um, and navigating their way through, through the energy sector and, and their relationships with suppliers. So, Janusz. Thank you, Natalie, very much for the voice and the challenge to summarize all the smart and interesting things and that were said uh, with, without time, really. But um, I will try to be brief, um, uh, which is not uh, quite easy for me, but I will st stick to my, to my notes, uh, which should help. So first of all, uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege for me um, to be among, a, among distinguished, such a distinguished speakers from renewed organizations. So thank you for the opportunity and uh, including us uh, as ADR bodies, mediators uh, and ombudsman in the session and in the works. Second of all, I am very happy that uh, despite challenging times, just after a year after announcing vision, we are not only talking about what needs to be done, but acting uh, to better understand problems that pe people are facing by analyzing real life scenarios and showing situations that are not to the cell domain. Uh, so, as, uh, as I said, I will try to be brief and stick to the notes. So here are, here are some thoughts, interesting uh, possible solutions uh, from the from our panel. Uh, for the Joneses, for, for the Joneses um, uh, we concluded, I think, that uh, they should be informed directly, uh, as Adele and also Claire uh, underlined, uh, not on not by internet but for example through the loudspeaker because this is the effective way uh, that we probably forgot about as Claire, uh, Claire, Claire mentioned uh, but it's very for, uh, effective especially for the people who um, have uh, lower uh, internet literacy so for the Joneses they should be informed and they can change the heating system with a a large, uh, the large public funding uh, should follow uh, behind it the information, uh, even 100 percent, uh, because um, this is not a rather uh, economic discussion uh, dilemma for them. Uh, but the, uh, but the, but the thing that is important for their house and uh, it should be supported um, by the public funding, and also they need the uh, support. Uh, Real support, meaning not only the information on the uh, on the in the internet or even through the loudspeaker, but also uh, through the uh, real people that will help them uh, to go through the whole process of changing uh, the heating system. 
uh, as for the Williams family, uh, uh, Barbara mentioned it, uh, probably the more democratic approach to protect tenants, uh, but also all consumer, but also all consumers uh, can be a, uh, can be a solution because it will engage them uh, more in the transition uh, and uh, create the possibility co-management and uh, as Eugene highlighted, cooperate. Uh, cooperate uh, in the uh, things that are important and crucial uh, for them. Uh, as for the town of Down, uh, the, the solution uh, that was mentioned by Claire, I think, but uh, it's uh, uh, it's on the map, let's say, for uh, for the DG Energy also. So uh, heat mapping, heat uh, heat planning, and look for the sources uh, that can. Um, there can be a solution, the alternative, for example, for example, thermal sources of heating um, can be can be and can can be an option. Um, from the pools, <laughs> I think that uh, it's important to to say that uh, most of us um, are rather checking bills occasionally because, as was mentioned by Monique and uh, through the discussion being uh, an engaged uh, consumer is a full-time uh, job really and we have our full-time jobs and uh, this is uh, something uh, at the side of course connected with the essential things uh, in our life but still uh, this is not a full-time job for us so we need someone uh, to help us uh, consumers need someone to help uh, help them uh, with understanding uh, and navigating through them uh, for the bill and for the energy uh, energy market itself, which is more and more complicated. Um, and uh, most of our audience also consider th consider themselves as uh, less active consumers, um, about 40 uh, 42 percent. Uh, and the last poll was about the uh, what would uh, what would they spend spend their money on? What would they what would they like to do? So most of us uh, would like to renovate uh, renovate the household and to be more energy efficient. So. I think it's a it's, it's a good idea. Um, I to, 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 how much time do I have, <laughs> Natalie? Because I, I know that we are uh, out of time, and I don't want to push too far. I'd say we we can stretch another five minutes on people's generosity. Oh, sorry, oh, thank you, thank you very much. I, I think that uh, I don't I will not need uh, much, but I would like to share an example from the Polish uh, from from the Polish. Uh, Mm, ground, let's say, uh, and then I will just uh, give you give back the voice to to you. So, uh, to to ensure inclusiveness, uh, we have to cooperate on European level, but also tackle the imperfections uh, at national grounds. For example, in Poland, as coordinator for negotiations to the president of the Energy Regulatory Office, I am performing ADR proceedings between households recipients of gas, fuel, electricity, and heat. Uh, and energy companies that had a dispute uh, which arose uh, from contract between them. But in Poland, most people uh, are not signing contracts for heating directly with the energy company. Uh, entities that uh, signs those contracts are, for instance, house, uh, housing communities, housing associations. And because they are legal persons, not natural persons, as household recipients are legally defined, they cannot feel a motion uh, to start pro proceedings before me. Uh, in that case, imperfect provisions uh, excludes almost all disputes arose from heating contracts from my jurisdiction and leave uh, households recipients uh, of the heat without access to ADR system. Uh, I bring that issue up, uh, propose changes in the statutory provisions, and hopefully uh, we'll see the changes. Um, just for the, as a closing remark, I think this is very important uh, uh, as uh, we were able to observe uh, at that session, Vision uh, 2030 is something we aspire for not only by writing fancy words in nicely edited uh, documents and presentations, uh, we are making it, in, it real day by day by working hard together to ensure that needs of actual people uh, will be addressed in rapidly changing reality and no one will be left behind. So. Uh, thank you for the attention. Uh, I have in script that I have I should remind uh, about uh, audience about the main program uh, of the European uh, European Union Sustainable Energy Week, uh, which is October 25 to 29. 
uh, the theme is uh, towards 2030 reshaping the european energy system that's all from me thank you very much thank you very much Anish. i think very very inspiring and and true words um we have to actually uh, go beyond the speaking and the fancy words to to real actions and and, I, and identifying situations and perversions that mean that people aren't getting the support or the the, the protections um, that they need in terms to exercise their rights and to make sure that they they understand how their energy use affects them and the and their wallets um not to be forgotten so maybe some key words came out for me today as well were uh solidarity of course democracy in different forms local 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 uh, support advice and and finance so i think those those elements are all part of the solution um for policymakers uh for companies for consumers for governments uh, for local authorities so certainly put together they and put into practice in creative ways they can certainly make a difference and and help us all contribute at, from the bottom up as monique was saying at the start and to this energy transition to a greener economy but also us just to managing uh the cost uh, and and our standard of livings and and be able to to continue um during during difficult times as we're saying well the last two years you could say have been difficult times in particular uh, for various reasons certainly very good well we have run a bit over we thank everybody who stayed a bit longer with us thank you very much to our panelists uh, it's been a pleasure uh, eugenie we don't see you on the screen but thank you again as well um you've been <laughs> a floating voice but uh, it was very interesting to hear as well uh, you know the real life cooperative and we hope to see you soon thank and you. other thank opportunities you. Ah, there you go. Uh, hopefully some of us will meet in, in, in Dublin uh, on the screens or, or however we manage to, to connect for the forum and, and may the discussions, uh, but more importantly, the actual actions continue and grow. Thank you very much. And a good weekend to everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye to all. Bye. Thank you.